Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be with you here this morning. I would like to say many f nice things to compliment you on, on being here, but they just cut my lecture by 15 minutes, so I've got to do it in 45. Uh, Mises once complained, I saw this in his correspondence, that he was being asked to all these silly things, give lectures on, could you please explain the Marxist theory of exploitation in 30 minutes? Okay, he found that was exaggerated. It was a different age. Today we are living in the age of the video clip and of the 30 second news comment. And if you're an expert, they're giving you three minutes to explain a very complicated subject. So it's not the theory of relativity this morning. It's uh, just the, the theory of subjective value in 45 minutes. We'll see how far it will go. The theory of subjective value is uh, the fundamental, uh, fundamental building block of economic theory. Uh, at the heart of economic analysis, we have the theory of prices. So we explain the causes of prices, we explain the nature of prices and uh, the, the consequences of prices, how uh, prices are being used by market participants to coordinate uh, the activities of millions and billions of people, so the, the division of labor between uh, a great number of human, human persons. So the theory of prices is the heart of economic analysis, the heart of uh, the theory of the division of labor, of capital theory, of the theory of ma uh, the market economy, of the theory of entrepreneurship, and so on. The theory of uh, subjective value, in its turn, is uh, the uh, element that we use to explain the, some of the causes of market prices. Right? So that's what we do in all scientific activity. We're interested in causes and in consequences. In economics, that's what we do as well. Right? We spend time uh, analyzing the consequences of any phenomenon, the nature of that phenomenon, and the causes of the phenomenon. So here, uh, we are concerned with uh, some of the causes of market prices, which brings us to the subject of uh, subjective value. As far as readings are concerned, because, well, 45 minutes is, of course, a lot by current day standards, but not sufficient if you want to get uh, a firmer grip on the subject, I recommend you take a look at uh, these um, writings, uh, most notably, of course, Karl Menger's Principles of Economics, the, especially the, the first uh, uh, seven chapters. Uh, then Eugen von uh, Böhm-Bawerk, uh, The Theory of Capital, also deals uh, with uh, price uh, theory. Uh, the best exposition is actually in Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy and State, uh, uh, the very lengthy uh, chapter one. And there are important uh, elements of the modern theory of subjective value in Ludwig von Mises' writings, most uh, notably in the theory of money and credit, uh, also chapter one. And then in his two books, Epistemological Problems of Economics and Theory and History. So, uh, if you want to learn the nuts and bolts of the Austrian theory of price, the best place to start is Marie Rothbard's uh, book, Man, Economy and State. And from there on, I suggest that you take a look at the other texts, if you are so inclined. We start then with a phenomenon that we are interested in, namely exchange. So we can define an exchange as a mutual conditional renunciation to property rights uh, to economic goods. And sometimes we renounce to property rights uh, without a, any mutual condition that is uh, involved. We, we make a gift uh, and so on. So that would be a, a, a unilateral um, a renunciation of uh, property rights to an economic good. In any, any case, what is important is that we renounce to property rights. The good, and ex, uh, the good that is being exchanged is not always physically transferred to some other person. This is most notably the case if we think of real estate, right? We do not really unplug a, a, a parcel of land and then hand it over to the other person. We exchange the, the right to that object. If we buy a car, we do not necessarily, as a, as a rule, but not necessarily, we pick up the car right away. We might also buy some, other, uh, buy some other object. I might buy from here a painting in Russia or some other place and then pick it up later. So, but still, the exchange goes on. I buy. Uh, this economic good now, so it belongs to me, and what belongs to me is the property right to that uh, good. So we always have um, here this uh, mutuality condition, I give so that you give, 
do ut des. So we have uh, this uh, formula that is uh, cherished by uh, lawyers and uh, legal professors. I give so that you give is a uh, characteristic feature uh, of the nature of an exchange. What, we, what is being exchanged are economic goods. Uh, we can spend already 45 minutes on the theory of goods, but we don't have time to do this. So therefore, I uh, encourage you to have a look at Karl Menger's Principles of Economics, who uh, starts all of his economic analysis from the analysis of economic goods. This was customary in German uh, economics in the 19th century. In the 20th century, it fell out of fashion for various reasons, some of which are good, some are not so good. So which will bring us uh, into the history of economic thought. I only have 45 minutes, not on that topic. <laughs> okay. But so, for example, in Mises and in Rothbard, you would not find, uh, as a starting point, a theory of economic goods. This is very 19th century uh, style going about these things. And an economic good is, uh, is, is a good that is something that is in a causal relationship with human welfare. Okay. And an economic good is invariably something so that is a, is a good and that can be controlled by human beings, right? So the moon is not an economic good, according to that definition. The sun is not an economic good, to the, uh, according to that con uh, condition. Uh, a good that is scarce and a good that we know of, right? So we know of the causal connection, right? So if one of these characteristics is missing, uh, we are not uh, in, in the presence of an economic good. So what we exchange is, is an economic good. An, an economic good, if, uh, something that is exchanged, always fulfills these criteria. Right? It's always a good, at least from the subjective point of view of the uh, exchanging parties. It's always scarce. It is always known that there is a causal connection between that good and the uh, welfare of the, of the two parties. Uh, and the good can be controlled. Otherwise, there would be no exchange. Right. Otherwise, it is sometimes objectively the condition is lacking that the good can be controlled. For example, the two of us, we could uh, draw a contract and I sell you the sun. Okay, we can do this, we are free to do this. But uh, in legal terms, this contract would be null and void right, because uh, the objective condition that the object be controllable is not fulfilled. So you see these condition, uh, considerations lead us in all sorts of complications right away. So I'll step away from this. Right? We're just, but I need to highlight as a professor that there are these considerations that already enter the scene here at a quite fundamental level. Uh, so we have property rights. I mentioned this. And then uh, the uh, third condition. Right? So if it must be an economic good. There must be property rights. The third condition that needs to be given for an exchange to take place is to have uh, inversely related subjective values. Okay, the uh, the good must be appreciated by the buyer more than by the seller. I want to give an example. So, if uh, we exchange an apple for an orange, then the person who sells the apple must. Uh, cherish the orange more than the apple. Right. And the other way around, the person who sells the orange must cherish the apple more than the orange that he sells. That is, for each of the two uh, partners to the exchange, the good that he acquires has a higher personal value to him than the good that he uh, gives up. And here we have the phenomenon of subjective value, it means the, uh, that we prefer something over another thing. Uh, and that in exchange, these preference relationships are uh, inverse uh, but uh, compa compatible. So the person buying the apple prefers the apple to the orange that he gives up, and the other way around. The other person uh, prefers the orange to the apple. So in, in an exchange, we have an agreement on property rights, right? Both partners agree that each one is the legitimate owner for the purpose of the exchange of the good that is being traded. But we have a disagreement on the personal or subjective value of the goods that are being exchanged. And without such a dis uh, this disagreement, the exchange could not take place. There where people agree on the subjective value of the two objects, 
an exchange could not take place. So if both persons say, yes, I like apples more than orange oranges, or this apple I like more than this orange, then the exchange would not take place. Right? And this, of course, holds true for any exchange that we make. If you buy ice cream, you buy a car, and so on and so on. And that explains why it's so difficult to give a car back once you have sold it, right? Or to give something else back once you have, uh, uh, once you have bought it, right? Because for the seller, he actually prefers your money to the object that he's sold to you. Right? If you buy a car from the Peugeot family in, in France, right? So it's a big car maker in France, still held by the family. Uh, I mean, how much, how many cars do they need for their personal needs? Uh, none, or, or a few. Let's say it's a big family. Meanwhile, there are a few hundred members, but so they might need a few hundred cars, and and they they build hundreds of thousands uh, and even millions of cars per year. So they don't need their cars, just like the baker doesn't need his own bread. Right? He wants to have the money. Right? So we have subjective values that. Already uh, the first uh, uh, description of this phenomenon, we now need to delve a little bit deeper into this. And first, by giving a more precise definition, subjective value is the relative importance of one economic good as compared to another economic good for an acting person at a distinct moment in time. Right, so we have various elements that come here into play. Most uh, importantly, right, there is a relation. Right? Subjective value uh, cannot be expressed absolutely. I cannot say, well, the subjective value of uh, the, this microphone is so and so. I cannot give a figure to express it. Right? It needs to be expressed relative to something else. Uh, so it is truly a relationship in which one economic good stands as compared to another good. <laughs> But a relationship from which point of view? Well, from the point of view of an acting person who has to make a decision about the two of them. A decision that takes place at a distinct moment in time, and usually, therefore, also at a distinct place. Right. All right, so we have these uh, uh, elements. Uh, it's a relationship. Right? It always involves, it's relative to another good. It's relative to a distinct person. It's relative to a, a distinct moment in time. Right, three relations that come here into play. Then, um, in uh, economic analysis and actual price theory, we use uh, a variant of uh, subjective value that we call a value scale, which is uh, an ordinal ranking. So this is not really a, does not belong to the nature of subjective value, but it's it's a way of expressing, of representing, of symbolizing what subjective value is all about. And so a value scale is the ordinal ranking of the subjective values of different economic goods. For example, let's say I have uh, different economic uh, uh, goods at my uh, disposition, uh, uh, most notably the, the, the way I use my time. So I can use my time attending a class. You can use your time attending this class. Uh, you could also spend your time uh, taking a walk. Now it gets a little hot out there, so, but, but still you could take a, a walk. Or you could uh, sleep at home or at your uh, student residence or in the hotel or wherever, or uh, in, in a park. So there are some shadowy, shadowy places here. Right? So uh, all of you, by being in this room, you have demonstrated that you prefer attending uh, this class to the other alternatives that were open to you. So we may represent uh, this by uh, putting these three alternatives in a horizontal order. Right? So I put uh, attending the class on top, right? and then taking the walk would have been my next best alternative, and sleeping at home the third best alternative. Now, please notice that, of course, strictly speaking, what we know is that you attend the class. That's what we see. That's demonstrated through the action. It becomes already much, much less clear when we uh, talk about the precise ordering of the alternative uh, uh, options, because here we do not really know. I mean, each one of us says, yes, if I had not attended this class, I would have studied at home. I would have given my old mother a, a telephone call and all these nice things. But truly, you might have spent uh, uh, your time playing video games or doing other such uh, silly things. <laughs> right? So we do not know. Right? We do not know. Uh, but in any case, as long as there are alternatives, we know, well, there must be a second best, there must be a third best, and so on. But we, of course, we cannot. Uh, uh, prove them. 
Now, so we've learned already various things about uh, subjective value, about the nature of subjective value. And one of, uh, we've also learned uh, something about its basic cause. It's the cause that Ludwig von Mises emphasized, namely the cause of subjective value is always the choice uh, made, or a choice made by human beings. So that's the most fundamental thing that we can say about subjective value. Value reflects the choices that we make. Now, there are various economic laws that uh, pertain to the causes of subjective value that we can articulate to a particular class of goods, namely homogeneous goods. Okay. And these are especially important for a great number of uh, economic <coughs> laws, especially in price theory, but also elsewhere. So we have homogeneous goods. Now, it needs to be said uh, right from the outset that, uh, strictly speaking, in physical terms, uh, it's very difficult to f define such a thing as a homogeneous good, right? Even if you think of something like wheat or oil and so on, there are always very tiny differences between distinct concrete units uh, of that good, and sometimes even difficult in the case of uh, oil or other liquids to define what the unit should be. Right? So this is, uh, this is certainly the case that is, if we try to define what a uh, homogeneous good is in terms of physical terms, we might have difficulties. And we might end up in something uh, saying like, well, this is an ideal conception or something of this sort, something that facilitates our thinking about this kind of, of, of object. Now, as far as economics is concerned, we're not really uh, all, all too much troubled with these kind of difficulties because what counts for us is uh, human behavior, is, is the choices of human beings and the way human beings approach their environment. So from the point of view of human beings, we know that certain uh, goods are considered to fall within the same class. That is, from the subjective point of view of the acting person, they are considered to be homogenous. And that's all that counts for us. Uh, so even though there might be differences between this and that uh, car or this and that sack of wheat uh, and uh, this and that, whatever, pair of shoes, from if the acting person considers them to be homogenous from the point of view of the activity that is being considered, well, that's then a homogenous good. Okay? Now, from that point of view, a great many uh, goods are homogenous or could at least potentially be homogenous. So it's a, a theory that applies to a wide variety of um, phenomena. Now, we have here a first law that pertains to the subjective value of uh, homogeneous goods, namely that a larger stock of such a good is always preferred to a smaller stock. So, for example, we have, if we uh, take one of my favorite examples, apples. I like apples. It's very healthy. Much more vitamin C, uh, by the way, than in um, uh, oranges, okay? Just to say this uh, as a side. And uh, the place where I live in France uh, is, is a big apple producer. We export them also to Russia and other places. That, that is, in recent months, the exports to Russia have a little bit declined. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good for the local producers. Well, so you take any homogenous good. For an homogenous good, a higher quantity is always more valuable for each person than a smaller quantity. Now, this is remarkable, and this, this needs one um, explanation, namely that, of course, we can imagine that we come to a point, well, if you have millions of apples and something, how can I possibly eat, even in my, my lifespan, millions of apples? So why should this uh, be better than having just the amount that I need for my life? So that's correct, right? But then uh, uh, the important thing is that this only pertains to economic goods. Right? So the good character of any object is not independent of its quantity. Right? It can become a nuisance if it, if it is too much. Right? So then it would be an economic bad. Right? But as long as it is a good, this relationship always holds. A higher quantity is more valuable than a lower quantity. Right? So again, of course, we do not know by looking just at, at something whether it is a good, whether it is too numerous, uh, to be still a good or whether it's still sufficiently scarce to be a, a good. We don't know this by looking at a thing. Right? So we need to have this concept that comes from econo economic analysis and not from some physical or physiological characteristic of the good that we are looking at. Okay. 
So as long as it is a good, a higher quantity is preferred to a, a smaller quantity, always. Uh, that's a logic, logical necessity. Now that's very interesting because although we are talking about something that is uh, uh, involved with uh, choice or rooted in choice, we might think that, well, uh, choice we are completely free, right? We can prefer a smaller quantity to a higher one and so on. No, we are, we are not. As long as uh, it is an economic good, we always prefer the higher quantity to the smaller one. Right? And if we sometimes, of course, we could say, well, uh, give me uh, whatever, 99 apples, I'll give you 101 in exchange. I'm free to do that, of course, right? Uh, but then, of course, the point what I w actually would demonstrate is only that I prefer to give a counterexample <laughs> to this law. Uh, right? And, and not, it's not really a refutation of this, of this logical point that a higher quantity is always preferred to a smaller one, always has a higher su subjective value. OK. Then there's a second very important law, and I'll uh, spend the rest of my time essentially on this one, uh, because there are other variants. According to this uh, law, uh, each unit of a larger stock has a lower value than each unit of a smaller stock. And this is sometimes said also expressed in the way that we say that each unit of a larger stock has a lower marginal value than each unit of a smaller stock. All right, so this is then the, the law of diminishing marginal value, one of the most fundamental laws in economic analysis. So, to give you an example, I'll uh, give you an example that uh, Bumbawerk has used. If I have uh, five sacks of wheat, right, and then I, I think of what will I do with the size of the five sacks of wheat, so I will use one of them uh, to bake bread and f feed my family, and then I have another sack that I will use to, uh, to make cake, uh, also for my family. I have a third one that, being a good German, that I will use to uh, distill some alcoholic beverage. <laughs> okay, if well, I also consume myself, and I have a fourth sack, which I will use to make, uh, make bread make for, for friends and, and relatives and so on, and a fifth sack that I will use for charitable purposes, because I try to be a good Christian. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, now what happens if one of those sacks uh, disappears? Right. Or not disappears, but it, let's say it's eaten by rats. Or I don't protect it well, and the rats eat it, or whatever. it becomes unusual because it's victim of a, of a, a fire or whatever. It, it's no longer available for, for use. Now, uh, clearly then, let's say it's the sack that I had earmarked for bread making for my family, which would for me be the most important use. So subjectively speaking, that's the highest uh, valued uh, use that I would have made of the sack. Now, does this mean if that sack is being eaten by the rats, does it mean that I would renounce to that use? Of course not, right? because I have four homogeneous uh, units that I could also uh, uh, apply to this, uh, this use. So I would take, a f in fact, I, what I would do is to renounce of that use that I cherish least, or that for me, subjectively speaking, is least important. So let's say it's um, uh, making uh, uh, cakes for uh, neighbors and, and so on. Okay, so then that use uh, would, would uh, disappear, but I would still be able to pursue the other projects. Okay. So the value of uh, the sack that was eaten by the rat corresponds to the least important use that would have, I would have made of it. Okay. Now that is, uh, therefore, uh, therefore we say, well, each unit of a larger stock, or we might say of a, of a smaller uh, stock, has a higher marginal value than each unit of the larger stock. Right? Um, so before I had five sacks, each sack had the value that corresponded to the least important use that I could make out of it. Of it. And each sack had the value that corresponded to the uh, uh, cake making for, for neighbors. Now, if I take one of those sacks away, because it's been eaten by the rats, right, it's so that I have four sacks left, now the value of each of those sacks corresponds to the least important use that I can make out of four. Uh, so let's say the, the least important out of the four is uh, the, the uh, spirits uh, making, uh, so the drink making. Oh, I'm shedding tears. Okay, but <laughs> let's say uh, I try to be rational, so this is, uh, this is what I do. Right, so then... Um, uh, right? Each of these four, uh, four sacks would have the value that corresponds to that use. 
Right? So the smaller is the total size, the total stock that I have, the more important becomes each one of the units that remains. And the other way around, if I acquire additional stacks, for example, because, well, I labor and so I get ob obtain additional wheat, or if somebody gives me an additional stack and so on, then with each additional stack, I can realize projects that were inaccessible before, right, but which are less important than those projects that I pers would have pursued with a smaller number of stacks. Right? If somebody gives me two extra stacks, I can now do things that I would have been unable to do with the, five, the first five stacks. So but these things, so I kept them in my mind, but I didn't think too much of it because uh, anyway, I just had five stacks. But now I have a sixth stack and, and, and a seventh one. So I can realize those projects that before were inaccessible uh, and become now realizable. But these projects being less important than the first five, right? It means that each, the sixth stack will have a lower value than, or each, more precisely, each stack out of a stock of six will have a lower value than each stack out of a stock of five. Okay. Now let me just insist uh, that, uh, again, I, I was just, I just stated the, the law in the wrong way, I said that the, the sixth stack has a lower value than the, the fifth stack, and that would not be correct. As a way you find very frequently in the literature, in the, in the sloppy literature, okay, the world is full of this. Um, right? So that would not be correct. It's not that the sixth stack had, has a lower value than the five preceding ones. It's, it's that each unit in a stock out of six has a lower value than each stack in a stock out of five. Right? Each unit in a homo homogeneous stock has the same value. Right? So it's as the stock increases, then each unit has a lower value than each unit in the stock of the smaller size. So if we give an example now again with apples, right, uh, an increase of a stock, well, it means so that uh, uh, an ad each additional unit will have a lower value than the previous additional uh, units that are received, right? So the first additional apple that I receive will necessarily have a higher marginal value than the second apple, additional apple that I receive, and the third additional apple that I receive. Right? Because the first apple increases the size of the total stock from, let's say, from five to six. The second apple that I receive increases the size from six to seven, and the third from seven to eight, and so on and so on. So with each additional apple, right, the stock increases, so more projects become accessible but these additional projects are of a lower subjective value as compared to the projects that I would have realized with the smaller stock. Uh, so therefore, the marginal value of each unit of the higher stock right, diminishes. So we can say the first additional apple is necessarily of a higher subjective value than the second additional apple received, and the third, and so on. Right? So this is an interesting result. We can uh, turn this the other way around, right? We um, uh, can now consider the reduction of a stock. Here, it's, so it's the opposite, right? The third apple gone necessarily has a higher subjective value than the, the second apple gone and then the first apple gone. Right? If I have initially a stock of five, it's one apple gone, okay, so I still have a stock of four. I can realize four, the four most important projects. If three apples are gone, I can only realize two projects. And these two projects are necessarily of a higher subjective value for me than uh, the, the fifth one that I would have realized with uh, a stock of five. Right? So the third apple gone must have, have, uh, uh, must have a higher value than the second apple gone, than the first apple gone. Right? And then, of course, the fourth one would have a higher value, the fifth one would have an even higher value, and so on. Right? So we get these orderings that are a logical consequence of the very nature of, uh, of an economic good. We can also articulate the, these two uh, aspects in one common value scale, right? So the, the third apple gone is so it's a higher value than the second apple gone than the first apple gone which in its turn must have a higher value than the first apple received, must have a higher value than the second apple received, and the third apple received, and so on. Right? So we can uh, uh, 
create or reconstruct this uh, value scale, this general value scale, as it pertains to one homogeneous goods. Good. Now, the next thing we can do is to... Uh, I, usually, I should now make a pause, right? So let, let it sink in. Right? So this is already very important stuff. Let it sink in. But since I have only 45 minutes, let it sink in! And uh, <laughs> so we move on to the next thing, which is uh, right, the creation of composite value scales. Right? The same thing that we did here for one good, we can do by integrating several goods, several homogeneous goods in particular. So let's say we have here um, uh, a very primitive market. There's no money, right? So we have uh, somebody uh, or persons who are exchanging chicken for apples, right? So the chicken apple market. It's not likely that this has ever existed uh, in, the, in the history of, uh, of uh, in economic history, but it doesn't matter, right? So we imagine something in which there's no money. Right. So we have here a pure seller of chickens. So he owns chicken and he wishes to acquire apples. Now let's say he has the following value scale. And what is important for us is not this concrete value scale, but just to get a feeling how this would look like. Right. So we have here a value scale uh, expressed in terms of apples per chicken that he receives. And here, so the first law that we discussed comes into play, right? A higher quantity received or higher quantity is always preferred to a lower quantity. Right? So 100 apples per chicken is always better than 99, is always better than 98, and so on per chicken. Okay. Now, uh, I put those uh, quantities in brackets, uh, taking over the... Uh, uh, writing convention proposed by Rothbard. I put this into brackets to signify that he does not own apples. He wishes to acquire apples. Okay. And he sells chicken, so he's a, a chicken owner. And let's say he has four, four chicken, or at least four chicken. All right. Then the first chicken that he sells is necessarily of least value for him because it would still leave him with a relatively high stock. Right. And the more chicken he sells, well, the smaller is the number of projects the, that he himself can realize with, with the chicken. That is, as he sells more chicken, then right, uh, each chicken becomes more valuable, right? The marginal value rises. Now, we can express this relative to apples, right? So the first chicken he would sell uh, in exchange for 91 apples because in his subjective judgment, they are more important than the chicken that he sells. He would not sell it for 90 apples, right? The ranking of the 90 apples is lower. Right. A second chicken he would sell for 92 apples, a third he would sell for 95 apples per chicken, and a fourth he would sell for 100 apples per chicken. Okay. Well, there's nothing really complicated, it's just an integration of the two things that we discussed before, with the further complication that there are now two uh, goods that are involved. Right. I know this is, this is quick, this is fast, but you'll find it in much detail, in, at exactly the pace that you wish, in Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, chapter one. Okay. So we can tra translate exactly, exactly here the same uh, value scale, right? So this is the same uh, value scale as on the previous slide, and we can tr translate this into a graphical expression. Now, it's not, I didn't plug in exactly the, the, the qu quantities and, and the prices, then it would look somewhat different, but just the tendency, right? So we obtain this tendency that the higher the price, the greater is the quantity supplied to the market. Right? So we have a positive relationship between the quantity supplied to the market and the price that the seller can expect. Okay? And which is, of course, the familiar uh, curve that we uh, know from economic studies. And you see that at some point this curve must become vertical because you cannot sell more than you have. Right. For some people try to sell us more than they have, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, same thing from the point of view of a, of a buyer. Right. For the buyer, it's the other way around. So he owns apples, okay, and he wishes to buy chicken. The first chicken for him has the highest subjective value, right? both as compared to the other chicken that he might buy, but also as compared to other economic goods that he might acquire. Right? So... Uh, the first chicken he buys, he would be ready to buy at the highest price. He would be ready to pay um, 97 apples for that chicken, not 98. 
right? Then the 98 would f have a higher value for him than the chicken, but he would pay 97. And for the second, he would pay uh, 92 uh, apples, and for the third, he would pay uh, 90 apples, and so on. Right? So we get, again, a, a demand schedule. Right? The tendency that we see here is that as the, uh, the price declines, the quantity demanded on, the, uh, on that market increases. Right? And this is what we express with this curve. Right? We have this negative relationship between the price on the one hand and the quantity demanded on the market. Right? So this is uh, how Austrian economists reconstruct demand and supply curves. And so it's, it involves no element of psychology uh, that you would find in, um, let's say, more mainstream texts uh, of, of a neoclassical band. There often you have some psychological underpinning. And this works a little bit in the case of demand curves. It doesn't work well, but it works at least a little bit when they say, yes, uh, the first chicken is, uh, is wonderful, it smells good, and it tastes great, and I'm very hungry, and so on. The second chicken, I'm already much less hungry. Uh, and so on, and then the third one is even worse, and, and eventually I get fed up with chicken, and so there's no more value at, at all, right? So, okay, that, that's okay, right? In many cases that works, but it doesn't work in all cases. Certainly this would not be a universal law, right? So sometimes you need to eat a first unit in order to, to develop a little appetite. Ah, I didn't know chicken before, but wow, this is not bad. Eat the first chicken, ah, great. And the second one, yes, and there were nuances that I didn't realize before, so my appetite even increases if I can stomach them. Right? <laughs> and sometimes the appetite increases even though you cannot stomach them. Right? So this is a different thing. I will not go into the history of culinary arts <laughs> to, to make my point, but believe me, uh, right, this psychological foundation does not always work. Right? But the praxeological foundation that I've presented to you, this is a universal. It's always the case right, that a greater number of units allows us to pursue additional projects, and these projects, by definition, must be less important to us than the projects that we would have pursued with a smaller number of units. Right? So this is a rock-bottom uh, explanation, derivation of a demand curve. Now, uh, we can uh, bring these two perspectives together, the perspective of the seller and of the buyer, and uh, uh, see that there is uh, a possible agreement uh, between uh, those two sides that is uh, maximizing the size of the market, uh, which is here uh, in the case of, uh, of two chickens exchange on the market. And, so certainly these two uh, persons might exchange just uh, uh, one chicken, or the buyer might just buy one chicken, okay, but it's also possible to buy a second chicken with mutual benefit, right? The person who wants to buy the second chicken, he's ready to pay 92 apples for each of the two chicken, okay? And the person who wants to buy, uh, to sell uh, two chicken, well, he uh, wants to have at least 91 apples uh, for each of, uh, excuse me, uh, he wants to, to at least uh, have 92 apples for each of the two chicken. And right? so at that price, he is ready to sell a first chicken and a second chicken, right? And the buyer would be ready to pay for two chicken at that price, right? The first one, he would actually pay more, but certainly pays also 90, 92 for the second, right? Uh, so, so in that case, then, it's possible to, with exchange two chicken with mutual benefits for the seller and for the buyer. It would not be possible to exchange three chicken because you see the, um, uh, the, the buyer, he would only give 90 apples in exchange and the seller, he would require to have at least 95. So they could not, with mutual benefit, exchange three chicken, but they could exchange two. So we can express this in, in this usual form, right? It's the point where the uh, two curves intersect, right, so graphically, so we have here the, the price, 92 apples per chicken, and the market quantity would be two chicken, right, so that's how you, how you do it. Okay, we can summarize. Whew, I did my job. I'm happy. Maybe you are not. Because after all, I mean, go through all this in, in 40 minutes or 45 minutes, well, it's quite a sport. Okay, so we can summarize our findings in three main points. Right? We've seen that subjective value is a relation. 
Uh, it's not a substance. It's not something that is inherent as, in, in a good. It's a relationship in which an economic good stands relative to some other economic good, relative to some person who has to decide between the two goods, and relative to a certain um, specific point in time. Okay. Second, uh, subjective value has some universal causes. As we've seen, it depends on the expected size of, uh, of the stock, of the good. I plugged in here the word expected. Right? This is another complication, right? Because sometimes the time dimension plays a role. And for example, if you uh, plan how you will use the wheat year that you are going, that you are right now planting, you know you will harvest the wheat in, uh, in August or in September. Right? So you're making plans of how to allocate it, and you can only do this once you have a rough idea of how much wheat will be at your disposition. Right? So it's the expected amount that uh, is, is relevant here. Right? So the subjective value of a homogeneous good depends on the size of the stock. Uh, homogeneous good, I repeat again, right? what is homogeneous depends on the point of view of the acting person. So what is homogeneous for one person does not need to be homogeneous for another person. It cannot be defined in all cases in physical uh, terms. And if you look hard in physical terms, there is no such thing as a homogeneous something. And then we have uh, the law of diminishing marginal value. Right? So there is an inverse relationship between the subjective value of any good and the size of the stock. Right? The, higher is the, uh, the larger is the stock, the smaller is the subjective value of each unit of that stock. And the other way around, the smaller is the stock, the higher is the subjective value of each unit of that stock. Now, so these were the two laws that I was concentrating on. There are others that will be brought up in subsequent lectures and which are actually quite important, especially for the theory of interest and for capital theory. Uh, for example, the relationship between what Austrians call higher order goods and lower order goods. Professor Salerno uh, talked about this, right? So if here in Austrian theory, a value relationship between the two, right? uh, lower order goods, uh, are of higher subjective value than higher order goods, right? uh, because you use higher order goods in order to obtain lower order goods. Right? That is, if you could choose between one and the other, you would rather have directly the lower order good. Right? You would rather directly have the consumer good uh, than having just the spare parts. Right? If, if somebody gives you well, all the elements of the microphone, and as an alternative, the microphone already uh, 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 ready-made, while well, you prefer the, the microphone uh, ready-made because uh, it uh, would relieve you of the uh, uh, additional work. Uh, same thing for present and future goods. Right? So, uh, in, uh, according to the theory of time preference, right? uh, present goods are held to be, have a higher subjective value than, than, than uh, future goods uh, of the same type. And so a present uh, uh, meal is considered to have a higher value than a future meal of the same sort. A present car is considered to, be a, to have a higher subjective value than a future car of the same sort, et cetera, et cetera. So this is important, again, right? Uh, that right, subjective value has, is subject to these laws, which is a difficulty if you think that, of course, value in itself springs from choice. Right? In choice, we are free. Uh, but still, our freedom, our liberty is not absolute. It's constrained by these laws that we do not usually notice. We wouldn't even notice unless we are specifically trained uh, to, to see this. And this is what we're doing, we doing here. And then finally, subjective value has also contingent causes. Right? So that depends on the specific circumstances of time and place. Right? After all, it's always... Uh, a, a human uh, choice that enters here into, um, uh, into the picture. My present choice might spring uh, from a variety of, of considerations. I might have this ice cream, then another one, for a number of considerations that depend on this specific day. Maybe I, I choose, uh, would usually choose, uh, let's say, a strawberry ice cream, but not today because I already had strawberries for breakfast. So this is a contingent condition. It's something that holds true only for today. Therefore, I make a different uh, choice uh, today. Right? So these also factors also come uh, into play. Uh, right? So finally, uh, right, the, the, the only uh, relevant 
uh, criterion by which we can judge the subjective value is always the uh, effect, effective action that is being taken place, uh, that is taking place, so the effective choice that is being made. Uh, made. You are in this room, therefore you demonstrate that you prefer attending this lecture rather than uh, uh, pursuing other activities. And so it is on the market as well. Right? It's very uh, uh, speculative, the, uh, theoretical, if you wish, sometimes to speculate about the contingent causes that might have come into play, because strictly speaking, we don't know them. That is, we hear the opinion of the person who has acted, and some people are pretty good judges of their own activities, but others are not. They do not uh, know what has prompted them, uh, or they do not want to avow what has really prompted them. Uh, in, in this and that uh, condition, but we always see what they have effectively done, and what they have effectively done reveals their number one preference, as the principle of demonstrated preference, a uh, concept that we owe to uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, in a, which he expressed in an article uh, published in 1956, uh, a reconstruction of value and utility, uh, of welfare and utility economics. So you can look this up as well. Well, I hope that uh, you are not deceived. Uh, sometimes after one's choice, one is deceived. You say, oh, I made an error. It's another important concept, right, in the theory of value. I made an error. So I hope you, you did not make an error in attending this, this lecture this morning. <laughs>